Hello, BookTube. Yesterday, Gina Stanier made a video about a loosey-goosey TBR reading plan for her coming August. Because as she points out in that video, I'll leave a link to it uh, down below, she is must-watching for BookTube. I hope you all know that. If you want to, to turn on a channel that makes you heave a relieved sigh, <sighs> because you get to visit uh, with Gina. <laughs> if you want that feeling, from a video, you definitely need to subscribe to her channel. But she did a loosey-goosey TBR sort of project for August, rightly pointing out that it's weird that August is right around the corner. Just weird. She mentions in her video that August is typically in the Northern Hemisphere, the dog days of summer. Typically, the, that's the month where you get the, the, the worst of summer, the most torrid parts of it, the, a long heat wave that doesn't seem to want to leave town, that sort of thing. And, uh, of course, that feels weird in 2023 because two-thirds of the country has been broiling in record-breaking, and I don't mean just in town, I mean on the planet, record-breaking heat for weeks now. Some, some places have gone uh, daytime highs of 115 degrees Fahrenheit, day after day after day after day after day after day, where it doesn't even get down to 95 at night. Uh, so looking at August and thinking, oh, the dog days of August, that feels a little weird, but it is still weird that the month is changing so soon. Uh, and of course, if Jean is going to make an August TBR, then so am I. So I, I looked at my August plans. I am hoping uh, to read 120 books in August or a little bit more. I'm hoping to do that. And I'm thinking right now that 60 or 70 of those books will be new releases, which is where I put the bulk of my energy. Usually I put it much higher than 50 or 60%. Uh, but August has a couple of events. I want to read a lot more Star Trek stuff for Book Trek. August is the last month of Book Trek 2023. And of course, August is also the month for Garb August, <laughs> one of BookTube's trashiest events, where we read garbage for the month of August. I plan on reading at least 30 books that fit that bill in August, so that that knocks it down below 100 anyway. I plan on doing a lot of reading for August, a lot of rereading for August, a lot of theme reading for BookTube and elsewhere. Uh, so I, I made a selection here of just a handful of the books that are definitely on my docket that kind of fit in a lot of categories. Uh, I don't know that there's any trash on my list right here, at least not the kind of trash that we're dealing with for Garb August. I'll make a separate video about this, but I want to stress what you already know, so you don't need me to stress it, but what can I say? Uh, which is that for Garb August, we're talking about fun. We're having fun for Garb August. Garb August is not, I'm perfectly willing to admit that Garb August is not the time for me to harp on about how bad I think Cormac McCarthy is, or how the fact that I think that William Faulkner is trash. They're taught in schools. They're revered by millions. We're, for, for August, we're talking about fun. We're talking about books that everybody admits are trash, or that almost everybody does. So, uh, I don't know that I have any of that kind of trash on this list. I might, for all I know, have the other kind of trash. Lord knows I encounter plenty of trash in reading new releases. Plenty of books that don't think they're trash, and they think they're quite good. <laughs> but fortunately, this first one, this first one's a reread. It's a big novel. It's coming out in August, and I already know that it's brilliant. I loved it. I expect only that I will love it more when I reread it. It's The Bee Sting by Paul Murray. A big, fat novel about a weird family that is falling apart on a fractal level. <laughs> I, I thought it was amazingly good. I think, well, a lot of you know what I think about contemporary fiction. It's largely anemic and on life support. And this was not. This was a big, bustling book that was alive right to the very end. Of course, the end is botched. No current writer of so-called literary fiction can end a novel. Not, I am convinced none of them know how to do it. None of them do. But everything right up until the end is <laughs> it's brilliant. So uh, I'll be rereading that. Then this first one is not a reread. Uh, this is not the first time that I've read this author. And this author has never really done much for me. Uh, but this is, this is a new book. This is by Donna Andrews. <laughs> it's, it's a cozy mystery called Birder, she wrote. <laughs> and I just have to read you the description of this. Those of you who don't know, maybe you don't. You know, you're not up on all the booktube categories. A cozy mystery is... It's a cute little mystery. It's meant to be fun. It's meant to be funny. Think of uh, Only Murder in the House. 
Only Murders in the House on cable. It's it's meant to be, yes, there's a dead body, or more than one dead body, but it's meant to be, it's full of quirky characters, and it's meant to be really enjoyable, despite the fact that it's a murder mystery. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm i a fan of Cozy's, but not as big a fan as some of the rest of you on book on BookTube, on BookTube. And I want to read you the description of this thing, because the description makes it sound like just about the best cozy mystery this year. Uh, Meg is relaxing in a hammock, test-tasting Michael's latest batch of Arnold Palmer's, and watching the hummingbirds at their feeders uh, when she hopes, when her hopes for an early, a relaxing early summer morning are dashed. First, her father recruits her to help her install a new batch of bees in the hive in her backyard. Then, Mayor Shifley recruits her to placate the NIMBYs, that's not in my backyard, uh, as she calls them, a group of newcomers to Carefully who have uh, built McMansions next door to working farms and then do their best to make life miserable for the farmers. And finally, Meg's grandmother shows up, trailed by a nosy reporter who is writing a feature on her for a genteel Southern Ladies magazine. You're on board on this already, <laughs> but we haven't even got to the murder. Uh, Cordelia drafts Meg to accompany her to Deacon Washington, to her and Deacon Washington of the New Life Baptist Church, and the reporter also, alas, uh, in their search for a long-lost African-American cemetery. Unfortunately, what they discover is not an ancient cemetery, but a fresh corpse. Can Meg protect her grandmother and the town of Carefully from the reporter who seeks to see the worst in everything and help crack the case before the killer finds another victim? <laughs> that is just about as cozy a cozy plot as I could imagine. So I will definitely, I will definitely come August be reading Birder She Wrote. <laughs> uh, then we have a reread. This is a, a direct riff from uh, Gina Standard's video, uh, because she mentions this book in her August plans, and the minute she did, I thought, well, I should put it on my August list as well, because Book Trek is continuing. Book Trek is a booktube event. It's now in its third year where we read Star Trek fiction. And for Book Trek 2023, we're reading Star Trek fiction all summer long. Uh, and in my case, that will involve a lot of rereading. I've read a lot of Star Trek fiction already over the course of 50 years. And I am going to reread this, Dwellers in the Crucible by Margaret Wander Bonanno, uh, in August. Because Gina Stanier is as well. I don't need much more nudging than that. Uh, I've read this twice now. I read it when it first came out, and then I read it years later. I'm going to try it again. I remember being badly disappointed by it. Uh, and I don't know if that's just endemic to the author. Because for whatever reason, Margot Water Banano wrote one of the greatest Star Trek novels of them all, Strangers from the Sky. And maybe an author who writes a book like that is always going to disappoint you afterwards. I don't know. It hasn't happened with Paul Murray. Uh, but it could be. <laughs> uh, I'm going to give this another try for August, and we'll see where I land with it. Uh, then we have Popular Science. This is by Maureen Seabird, and this is Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. This is not a creationist tract, I should keep in mind. You were not made. You evolved. Uh, but this is about human senses, which might seem pretty straightforward, but this book, I think, is designed to show that it is absolutely not. That the, the realm of the human senses is, the, the latest research on it makes them more amazing than ever. I'm hoping that that's what this kind of thing is. Actually, I'm only... I'm only hoping that it's not fundamentalist creationist. That would be a bitter, bitter disappointment if that's what this were Trojan horsing its way onto my reading list being. I read enough of that crap anyway. I don't want to read it for, you know, real books. <laughs> but we shall see. I think this will probably be popular, popular science. Then we have uh, Shelley Parker Chan. This is He Who Drowned the World. This is her follow-up to She Who Became the Sun, I think was the name of it. It did well, her fantasy debut. Uh, it didn't do well with me. It seemed to me to be, talk about Trojan Horse, the She Who Became the Sun seemed to me to be, uh, it was a, I have to watch my words all of a sudden. It was a competent fantasy, but it seemed to me that it was, its main purpose for being was to smuggle in a lot of Twitter propaganda. I got the impression by the end of that book that it was dealing in two levels of fantasy, as I've mentioned on this channel before. Uh, there's the level of fantasy in which you are living in the real world, the world that I'm living in, the world that we're all living in, and you are writing a fantasy story about a different world. And then there's the, day, the double layer of fantasy where you're writing a fantasy about a, a fantasy world, but you also live in a fantasy world. You live in a world where 
chromosomes do not determine your biological sex. You live in a world where interlibrary loans and experiments in physics were being busily and happily conducting in 4th century Ethiopia. You live in a world in which the Enlightenment is pure colonialism and in which science has been around all along and only been mucked up by people with white skin. Uh, you live in a... Increasingly, I have seen fantasy and science fiction stories that live in a fantasy world to begin with. So it's two fantasies that you have to, that you have to take on board. And one of them you can either like or dislike as a critic. And the other, if you disagree with it at all, you'll lose your job and probably have your house fired off. So I, I, got, I got a little bit of that in She Who Became the Sun, and I don't know what to expect here. I remember the book well, which speaks well of it. There, there was very effective stuff in it, so we'll see what the sequel is like. We'll see if... Uh, I'm perfectly willing, when it comes to this book, I am ready to DNF it, which I don't usually do with books. I, I read very fast. I read for a living. I read all the time. So usually, even if a book is really annoying me, I will continue. But... DNF in the in the terminology of BookTube is just saying no. You're not saying I'm putting this aside till later. You're saying no. I this is not for me. It's not going to work for me. I'm I'm do not finish and I'm not going to finish. I very rarely do that with books, but if I get that double fantasy impression from this book, I am going to stop. So we will see. We'll see how it does. Uh, then we'll get back to uh, safer ground. <laughs> we'll get back to more popular science. This is by Avi Loeb, and this is Interstellar. Uh, which is about humanity's search for extraterrestrials out in the universe. We have logged, cataloged thousands of Earth-like exoplanets, thousands of them. We mainly know them by a tiny sliver of a window, a, the, a tiny change or wobble that they make in their sun's spectrum as the planet passes in front of the star. That's not much to go on. It certainly can't tell us anything about life on that planet. Uh, it can tell us a little bit about the composition of its atmosphere, which tells us a lot about what its electromagnetic field is like, maybe what its, the, the size of it is like, but it can't tell us anything more than that, really. So we don't know. We know that if you take as the sine qua non of intelligent life, or life just in general, if you take as the absolute necessity of that water, liquid water, and freedom from scouring hard radiation, then you kind of know what you need for life, even just bacteria. You need liquid water, and you need some sort of protection from the scouring hard radiation that is the norm rather than the exception everywhere in the universe. <laughs> the problem on the surface of the moon or on the surface of Mars would not necessarily be the lower gravity or the lack of air. It would be that you would be bombarded by radiation, hard radiation, all the time. No electromagnetic sphere, so no protection from that. Hence the, the turn of the attention of scientists to, for instance, vast subterranean oceans on a Jovian moon, where two miles of ice would protect that water from radiation. Maybe something lives there. If microorganisms entered those oceans and have been evolving for millions of years, then maybe something lives in those oceans, protected from the radiation, and having the water that is necessary for reproduction. We don't know much about how we're going to tell. I don't know what Avi Loeb is going to be able to tell me about that. Maybe nothing. Sometimes these popular science books don't end up telling me anything that I didn't already know. But that wouldn't preclude it from criticism or from a review, because there's still the question of how it does that. Either way, it's bottomlessly interesting to me, so I, I happily dive on board. Uh, then we have a publishing memoir. These are usually very niche things. They usually don't get much attention outside of the publishing world. But since the broad penumbra of the publishing world usually includes the critical world, this book could get reviewed in the U.S. This is The Maverick. It's by Thomas Harding, and it's a biography of George Wiedenfeld, uh, who was a, a, a visionary publisher in the U.K. and in America. Uh, champion hobnobber, as you can tell, because it's got a blurb by Henry Kissinger there. They were friends. They were buddies. He was buddies with everybody. He knew absolutely everybody and was a fairly genial figure in the publishing world. I don't know that... I know a fair amount about his life. I don't know that much of it makes for the grist of a good biography. This is not the same thing as Blanche Knopf. Blanche Knopf had a book of her own, The Lady with the Borzoi. It was also a publishing niche thing. It got reviewed fairly widely. Blanche Knopf 
did things. She, she, she went to the continent and found great writers that, that the cloistered imagination of her America would never have considered and made them consider it. Whereas the, George Wiedenfeld, it's pretty much Lolita. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe there's a lot more of this guy than I think. I would definitely would never miss this. No, not a chance in a million. I've read a million of this guy's books. But uh, we'll have to see. We'll have to see if it's, if it's anything more than what it looks. Uh, then we have James Sturrs. I don't know how this thing came to my attention. This is a novel with a great American cover. This is Under Jungle. It's a science fiction, speculative fiction novel about a weird species that has always lived deep, deep in Earth's oceans. It's not a fish, and it's broken off into subspecies, and it starts to become aware that life has evolved on land. Life has migrated to land, and it starts to become aware of that, and then what are the different species of the under jungle going to do? Are they going to band together? How are they going to address this? It sounds like the, the makings of a really interesting science fiction novel. I remember, uh, what was it? It was by an author named Schatz. It was translated from the German. Big, thick book, blue book. Was it called The Swarm? It was similar. It was a big, fat science fiction book from decades ago, uh, or a decade ago. It made it into the American book market. I think about the ocean becoming sentient, or maybe some species in the ocean becoming sentient and declaring war on man. We'll see how much this reminds me of that. But uh, look forward to it anyway. And we'll stick with the ocean to finish up here. Uh, the Underworld by Susan Casey. This is. I think I've mentioned this before on this channel. This is the author writing about the people and her own adventures who go down where no one should go, into deep, deep chasms of the ocean, deep caverns and hidden caves and crevasses and ocean floors that are absolutely deadly to you. They are, they are a long, long way from the light of the sun, a long, long way from the surface, where, where the pressure will crush tin if you're exposed to it. it uh, these are, I don't doubt, wonderful landscapes. Should be pretty interesting to read. But I'm going to be creeping with horror the whole time. You don't, you don't go into the ocean. <laughs> you don't go into the ocean. It, it hates you. It might have given birth to life on Earth at one point, but it hates you. I, I never understand people who are on, you know, yachts and just dive carefree into the ocean to go for a swim. I've never understood people who dive in the ocean, dive on wrecks where sharks congregate just to make small talk. I've never understood people who go diving deeper than that into caverns where the slightest mix-up in your hoses or tanks and you die. You get caught and you die. I, I've never understood it. I, I think that will probably add to the allure here. This, uh, I think you could probably agree this. And there's an added allure to reading a book that is recounting something you would never in a million years do yourself. There's a kind of an extra chill to that for me. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see whether or not this actually does that or just is boring. Uh, but anyway, that's it. So we have The Underworld. Uh, we have Under Jungle, uh, science fiction that dare not speak its name. I don't think this is being marketed as science fiction. I think it's being marketed as uh, fiction, or at the most, speculative fiction, which is the uptown name that publishers tend to give to science fiction, to woo in the readers who will read The Handmaid's Tale, but they won't read The Dispossessed. <laughs> uh, then we have The Maverick, a publishing memoir. Uh, we have Interstellar by Avi Loeb. Did any of, you, any of the rest of you read this guy? I found him quite good. Uh, not really all that challenging, but quite entertaining. We'll see what he has to say here. Uh, Despite, this is, this is despite, uh, let's get back to it here. This is despite a, a famous, now an infamous hearing in front of the U.S. Congress where an obviously insane guy was talking about how, you know, oh, we got alien bodies. <laughs> Happy to give you the details uh, in a private room. <laughs> I'm sure, Ars Medley. Uh, then we have He Who Drowned the World. Uh, challenging stuff, we'll see. I, I had... Really good impressions of the first book and also really bad impressions of the first book. Uh, we'll see. I, I, I thought the first book was extremely well done fantasy that felt like it had a social agenda. And some of you might say all fiction has a social agenda, and maybe you're right about that. 
but I don't want it clinking. I don't want to hear it in the kitchen. I want to be, if, if you have a social agenda, I want you to hide that fact from me. Typically speaking, the books that don't are failures. Uh, I thought on the one hand, there was a remarkable richness of imagination. On the other hand, I felt like this was written with an agenda. And I am being judged on whether or not I agree with the agenda rather than on whether or not I'm being swept away by the story. Uh, maybe that does a whole video on its own, or maybe you've heard as much as you want to hear. Then we have Maureen Seberg, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, about the human senses. Notice how the eye on this lovely cover is kind of mimicking a nebula or even the earth itself. What does it mean for you to feel? How amazing is the human eye? You might think, well, when I take my glasses off, I can't see anything. But a normal human eye, a normal healthy human eye, can perceive almost infinitesimally small amounts of light in the dark. Might not be able to do much with that. It might have to be in the visible spectrum. But it can be a tiny little pinprick of light. Humans are regularly tested on that. And it's amazing how sensitive it is. Same thing is true with the other human senses. Some of this world I know better than others. I have been subjected to hearing and scent tests to a greater degree and a further complexity than most people have. I, I imagine that, that this will be broken up chapter by chapter, sense by sense. We'll see. We'll see what I make of it. Uh, then Dwellers in the Crucible. I don't remember liking this. I remember it maundering. Uh, and I remember most of the characters being out of character. So... Uh, we'll see. I suppose it's possible that you could say that in Strangers from the Sky, most of the characters are out of character, except it's Strangers from the Sky is dealing with alternate realities, so maybe you can get away with it there. Maybe no readers, maybe readers cut at a greater degree of slack than they would here. Uh, I don't know. I, even if, I'm figuring it's it's win-win. One, because this appeases Gina Stanley. You don't want to get on her bad side. <laughs> Two, if I like it on a third reading, well, great, then I have I have I can now perceive more of what the author has, is doing in the book, and I will now like a Star Trek book. And if I don't like it, it will send me back to Strangers in the Sky, which I've read an infinite number of times, so I know that I will like it. Uh, and then <laughs> Birder, she wrote, <laughs> a new cozy mystery from Donna Andrews, who's never really pleased me. I've always, talk about agendas in books, I've always seen too easily what she was trying to do. And I don't like that. I, I, that's artificial. I don't want to hear the stage directions coming from behind the curtain. I don't want to hear that. And it doesn't matter how much you love your story. If you love it so much that you can't resist that, I'm going to notice it, and it's going to decrease my interest. Uh, we shall see, though. Uh, and finally, The Bee Sting by Paul Murray, which I'm hoping gets lots of critical attention when it comes out. I'm hoping. I have certainly talked about it enough with fellow critics. It's really, really good. This author's best thing. Uh, so anyway, that is a loosey-goosey August TBR. I could do a hundred of these, obviously. Or actually, no, I could do 10 more of these. <laughs> Numerically, these numbers are difficult. I could do 10 more of these. I plan on reading a lot of books in August. But the thing is, I probably couldn't do it because I don't know what a lot of those books will be. I certainly don't have a TBR for Garb August. I know that a lot of my co-hosts are putting up TBRs, but that's because their, limit, their reading time is very limited. They actually do have only the ability to read four or five books for Garb August in August. So they want to plan get as many categories under their belt as they can. I'm going to do a lot more than that, at least a garbage book a day for Garb August. So I don't have to make a TBR along those lines. But even if I wanted to, I couldn't because I don't know what I'm going to find. Where am I going to, what am I going to find at, at uh, secondhand bookstores at the Brattle? Or perhaps a different secondhand bookstore that may be on my horizon in August. <laughs> Who knows? I don't know what I'm going to count, or what I'm going to find. And unlike a lot of booktubers, when I find a big pile of books at a secondhand venue of whatever kind, I don't just chuck it onto a shelf and think in a few years I'll get to it. I don't think I have a few years. <laughs> so I dig in to those piles right away, and that will affect my TBR. But I figured if Gina was doing a loosey goosey TBR, this is plenty loosey goosey. I know that I will get to these things. Rereads, new reads open question marks, authors I already like, and you know what's coming. Make a loosey-goosey August TBR of your own. <laughs> Gina Stanier commands it, and you already know you don't want to get on her bad side. <laughs> Make a loosey-goosey August TBR of your own. Factor in the booktube events that you're going to be dealing with. There's Book Trek. There's Garb August, of course, which I'm assuming you're all going to honor in one way or another. There's something else 
right? Oh, Faulkner in August. Well, if you're doing Faulkner in August, you might as well confess it to me. <laughs> you might as well. It won't ruin our friendship. But isn't there another booktube event in August? I could swear there was. In addition to all of that, uh, well, let me know. Make a video and tell me what your loosey-goosey August TBR is. But I'm going to wrap this up for now. Uh, but I'll be back. Perhaps I'll be back today. Oh, I'm full of mysteries today, aren't I? <laughs> I will wrap this up for now. And I will see you soon, booktube. Ha <laughs> ha.